There are many moons in the solar system, but none like ours. It exerts an extraordinary influence on planet Earth, keeping our world in balance. But why is it so powerful? I want to explore the relationship we have with our closest neighbour, to see how the moon has sculpted our planet and shaped our evolution. Without the moon, would we even be here? I'm Maggie Adairin Pocock. I'm a space scientist and a lunar fanatic. I've always been mad about the moon, convinced it plays a huge role in our lives. But I've always taken for granted that it is where it is in the night sky, a quarter of a million miles away. In this film, I'm taking nothing for granted. I'm going to find out what would happen if the moon wasn't where it is now. What if the moon was in a different position? Closer or further away? How different would our world be? The moon is a ball of rock out in space, but it has the power to create great tides here on Earth. This is Loch Etiv on the west coast of Scotland. Twice a day, the moon causes up to 66 million tonnes of seawater to flood through this loch. The result? White water rapids. The head of the lock is like a bottleneck. Water is funneled through a very narrow channel. And for an hour or two, this becomes one of the wildest, wettest rides in the world. These are the falls of Laura. That's what the locals call them. In Gaelic, Laura means noisy. Because as the tidal waters rush out of the lock, it gets very, very loud. Hikers come from all across the world to take the challenge of these waters. But they have to paddle like mad just to keep up. Even our outboard engine is struggling with the flow. This is what the power of the moon looks like, up close. My love affair with the moon began as a child. I wish I was a spaceman, the fastest guy alive. I was born in 1968, in the age of Apollo. I took my first steps as Neil Armstrong took his giant leap. Of course, I was too young to know what was going on, but the images became seared in my mind. From an early age, I wanted to go to the moon. At school, I struggled because I'm dyslexic. But then I discovered science and something clicked. I wanted to become a scientist. And sure enough, today I build satellites. It's a mix of engineering and physics, and I love it. But now that I'm a space scientist, hardly anyone is talking about the moon anymore. It used to be the new frontier, our future. Now it's seen as quaint, old fashioned, irrelevant. I think that's wrong, completely wrong. I'm still mad about the moon, not just because I want to be an astronaut and go there one day, no, I'm mad about the moon because the more I find out about it, 
the more extraordinary it seems. The way its presence can conjure up this torrent of water and these waves. And how does it do this? With the help of gravity. Gravity is a great universal force of attraction. It keeps us firmly in our place on Earth and keeps the moon in orbit around us. But while the Earth is attracting the moon, the moon is also attracting the Earth, pulling at our oceans. So I have a set of scales, a metal block and a powerful little magnet. You see, the force of gravity is very similar to magnetism. They're both forces of attraction. If I put the metal block on the scales, you can see it weighs 1.3 kilograms. When I put the magnet in and nudge it closer, the block appears to weigh less. You can see the needle moving. That's because the magnet is attracting the metal towards it, pulling it upwards off the scales. And that's what the moon's doing. It's pulling on the oceans, moving them upwards, away from the surface of the Earth. The gravitational force of the moon causes the oceans to bulge slightly. And as the Earth spins, this bulging produces high and low tides. The size of the tides depends on the distance between the Earth and the Moon. The laws of physics are very clear about this. The closer two things are, the more they attract each other, the greater the gravitational force. So we get the tides we do because the Moon is where it is, nearly a quarter of a million miles away. But what if the Moon were closer? If the Moon were just a little closer than it is today, the tidal bulge would grow. Low tides would be lower, high tides would be higher, and any low-lying coastline would be flooded. But what if the moon were much closer? Five times, ten times, twenty times closer than it is today. How would that affect the tides and life here on Earth? Another rush hour in London. But this evening, as the sun sets, a huge moon rises. 20 times closer than normal. This supersized moon exerts a supersized gravitational force. 400 times stronger than we're used to. And it creates a mighty tidal bulge. Seawater pours across the British Isles. London is flooded. Hours later, the same tidal bulge hits the east coast of America. And the story is the same. It's New York's turn to disappear underwater. A city submerged. And all the work of the moon. Eventually, of course, the tide subsides. And the waters retreat. This scenario may seem rather far-fetched, like the plot of some disaster movie. But something similar has happened. Once upon a time, when the moon was newly formed, it really was so close, and really was so powerful. 
Let me take you back to the earliest days of our planet. Four and a half billion years ago. At this time, the Earth had no moon. It was orbiting the sun alone. And it was being assaulted by rocks and comets. Today, there are no scars left from this cosmic pinball. But to get a sense of the damage that was done, I've come to the Arizona desert, to a great hole in the ground. This is a beautiful crater, a near perfect circle, a mile in diameter. It was formed when a meteorite crashed into the Earth a mere 50,000 years ago. That's nothing on the time scale that we're talking about. But it's amazing how much damage that one passing rock can cause. The early Earth was bombarded with rocks. It must have been mayhem. And then along came something much, much bigger. Another planet, the size of Mars, drifted into the path of Earth. It was on a collision course. It hit the young Earth with a glancing blow. Imagine the power released by such a collision. The impact sent a mass of liquid rock into orbit. This debris coalesced into a ball. And the moon was formed. Just 14,000 miles away from the early Earth. This was the closest point it could have been. Any closer, and the debris would have come crashing back to Earth. And our moon wouldn't exist. Today, the moon is just a rock, reflecting the sun's light. But back then, it was a molten sphere, burning brightly. It must have looked amazing an enormous orange disk in the sky. Imagine the sea. The first moonrise over the early Earth. Our world was no longer alone. It had a huge, powerful neighbour. And ever since, this has been a very different type of planet. The collision that created the moon reset the basic chemistry of Earth. And Earth, Mark II, was a place on which life could begin. The collision released huge quantities of metal from the Earth's core. One particular metal that would help change the atmosphere of our planet. I'm talking about iron. Iron is incredibly reactive. Leaves them out in the garden and it will rust. It also combines with other chemicals to release gases such as methane, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Today, we see these gases as toxic and rather unpleasant. But in the early Earth, these were, this was the very stuff of life. In the 1950s, American chemist Stanley Miller did a classic experiment. He took a cocktail of these gases and tried to simulate conditions on the early Earth, adding electricity to mimic the power of lightning. And what emerged, to everyone's surprise, was a flask of slime, which turned out to be full of amino acids. Like iron, amino acids are essential for life. They are the raw material from which proteins are made. And this great chemist was able to produce them using gases that were available on the early Earth. The collision that formed the moon helped set the scene 
for life to begin. But there was still a way to go. Life didn't start immediately after the collision. It took up to 700 million years for the first living cells to emerge. During this time, the Earth was cooling down. It formed a rocky surface. Water vapor condensed to form oceans. And these oceans were being tugged by the moon. They were becoming tidal. According to the latest theory from one leading chemist, these early tides may have been the trigger that kick-started life into action. This seems like a very odd place to do some chemistry. Why are we here? On the beach to investigate the effect of tides on chemistry taking place on the very early Earth, billions of years ago. So it fills all these Professor John Sutherland believes the ebb and flow of the tides may have played a crucial role in the origin of life. And is going to show me how it could have happened. We introduce some chemistry here. He's mixing up the sort of basic chemicals found in the first oceans and adding water. He's reproducing a tidal pool in his flask. And that's your starting tidal pool at high tide. Then the tide goes out, the sun shines on the pool and starts drying it out. And rather than wait for that to happen here, it's going to take a long time, I'm going to speed it up a bit by using a uh, burner here. So what are we trying to mimic? We're trying to mimic the, the power of the moon in chemistry on Earth. So 